welcome to the launch of our second Let's Talk About Florida book discussion. We're coming to you live from the History Center. I'm Pat Agle, serving today as your moderator. The program producers, Sean and Brooks Paxton, as well as our in-person tech, Vic Redman, stand by to assist if and when needed. I met Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in the late 80s in Miami, and I attended her presentation on the importance of saving the glades. She was a charming yet powerful person, fully alive and passionate about not only the Everglades, but her beloved state of Florida. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas was born in 1890. When she was four, she went with her parents on a trip to Florida. She would always remember the marvelous light, the wonderful white tropic light. From a young age, she loved books and to write stories of her own. In the fall of 1908, Marjorie left home to attend Wellesley. She continued her writing and found a new interest in public speaking. In 1911, her third year at Wellesley, she and her friends formed a group to support the voting rights of women. Until 1920, only men could vote. When asked why she formed the club, Marjorie explained, well, you have to stand up for some things in this world. She moved to Florida shortly after graduating from college. She joined her father at his newly acquired newspaper, The Herald in Miami, as a reporter. At this time, Florida was still largely an undeveloped area. Douglas was quickly drawn into the debate over the future of the Everglades. Florida's Governor Broward wanted the Everglades drained. Marjorie's father, Frank Stoneman, wanted the Glades protected as a wilderness area. She formed a committee to establish the Glades as a national park, which would be protected by the federal government. After 20 years of arguing and debating, the public had an outcry for change. Finally, they understood the subtle balance of water being critical to the whole nation. In 1947, the year her book, Everglades, A River of Grass, was published, President Harry S. Truman dedicated the Everglades National Park. Only a fraction of the wilderness ecosystem was protected. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas received many conservation awards throughout her life. For more than 60 years, she was dedicated to informing people of the importance of the Florida Everglades and for her efforts to conserve, to protect, and to restore the Everglades. The public's concern about the threatened ecosystem was her best reward. She lived to the age of 108, a full and active life. So Pam, did you wanna make a comment about the connection to a land remembered? It's so nice to be back together. I thoroughly enjoyed our first discussion and the fact that so many of you have come back. I think you did too. Mm -hmm. As you know, this is a new program for the History Center and one that it looks like we're going to continue because I think it is turning out uh, very well. Um, In my own effort to learn about Florida over the last several years since we've moved here, Um, I read both books a while ago, but uh, with some separation between them. So this has really been amazing to read them now back to back together and to see the amazing messages that both of these authors uh, tell us uh, in their own way and their own style about the Everglades. And I'm just going to read a a couple passages. I'm going to start with Marjorie. I think one of the things that caught my eye reading both was this description of the custard apple forest, Mm -hmm. something I'd certainly never heard of. And uh, you'll see the picture. Some people, well, it was hugely interesting And the way it evolved, it was critical to the drainage and the flow of the water uh, from Lake Okeechobee. The the forest itself sat on the southwest corner. It was 32,000 acres. 
until it was destroyed. Marjorie talks about one begins with the plants. If the sawgrass here is 4,000 years old, many other of these plant associations may have been here almost as long. Southwest, it was all custard apple, a subtrophic, rough barked, inconspicuous tree with small pointed leaves and soft fruits. And I understand the fruits actually taste like custard, thus the name. It grew fiercely, crowded on roots that became gnarled trunks or trunks twisted and arched into bracing roots in the drag of the water. The spilth and decay of the custard apple, the guano of crowds of birds that fed on them, whitening the leaves built up in the watery sunlessness below, an area of rich black peat, denser than muck, two or three miles wide and six or eight feet deep. The earliest Americans on the lake called this area the custard apple bottoms. It was edged with ferns and Boston ferns and knotted with vines, which meant no man could get through without axes or dynamite, like water crept and the lake water crept darkly below. And I think we see this uh, in the picture. And of course the muck, unfortunately, was seen as the rich farmland. And so when we met uh, our McIvey family in a land remembered, uh, Zek understood uh, just the sheer beauty, magnitude, and value of this as natural forest. But as you may remember, his son saw, uh, sought saw something else. He hired dredges to gash the earth and drain it, paying with Spanish gold. Then the men in saws and machines to rip out the giant bald cypress and the hickory and the oak and the cabbage palms and the palmetto. Uh, and then he turned his attention to the land somewhat southwest of the lake, attacking the custard apple forest with more dredges and men and machines, cutting down the ancient trees with their canopies of thick moon vines, ripping out the lush beds of lacy ferns, strewing the ground with thousands of air plants and wild orchids that soon shriveled and then disintegrated, burning all of it in huge bonfires that blackened the sky with smoke slowly transforming jungle into more fields that were destined to put more vegetables onto the tables in Palm Beach and Fort Lauderdale and Miami and New York and Boston. Some of this land would also be planted with sugar cane. And as you may remember from reading the book, there's a point after he has done this where Saul meets his half Indian brother, Toby, who is just appalled, of course, at what Saul has done. And Saul's response was, he's totally surprised that Toby's so angry. It's just a swamp and there's plenty more of it. Uh, so in different voices, different cadences, these two authors really shared with, uh, with, with their readers the beauty and the priceless nature of these Everglades, both in their own way, calling to us to save and restore what is left. So it, it turned out to be just so interesting to have the juxtaposition of the two books. Mm, thank like, you, Pam. Really important connection, I think. Different books, but the story is very much the same. <clears throat> we want to take a moment this time to have our guest introduce themselves and just give us a little brief statement of what your expectations might be on joining us today in this book discussion. 
So if I could start with Larry Shaftenar. Larry, unmute. There we go. Yeah. Hi, I'm Larry. Hi. Uh, I'm just hoping to get an idea of, and meet some of you and see what your experiences have been with us. I've worked with conservation and nature studies and all that stuff for over 50 years. So. Uh, I do have a history in a lot of this, but maybe I'll talk about that later when we come into the discussion. Mm -hmm. Thanks. David? 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 Hi. Yeah, hi. How's everybody hi. doing? <laughs> Good. Um, you know, I've heard so much about these things and uh, uh, about, I've read so much about the Everglades and it's been many years since I've read this book. Um, but I will tell you that uh, almost every Florida journalist that I know has read this book. And, you know, and I think it's part of what's uh, in our heart about trying to save this great land. And uh, there are so many, you know, I want to talk just a second about how I've been through the Everglades with uh, a friend of mine who's a Miccosukee Indian, and, oh. and and you can all go there and do this. If you call the Miccosukee Tribe headquarters, you can look it up online, and, and they'll take you out on an airboat ride, uh, and it is unbelievable, and, and you'll really get a true feeling for uh, the Glades. Um, and I guess what I wanted to try to learn here today is is to hear what everybody else has to say about the glades. I mean, I, I think probably a lot of you may not have been in it or know its impact and and a lot about how big sugar and big citrus have really decimated the Everglades. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, Jim Nordley. <laughs> Jim, on, on mute. He's working on okay. you, You're speaking to Jim Barker? Jim Nordley. Oh, I'm sorry. How's that? Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Okay. Yeah, I said that we, um, we took a trip to the Everglades with the, uh, uh, I think with Pam for sure. And uh, mm -hmm. when we did the, the, the uh, airboat ride down there, spent the night in I think it's Everglades City. Right. And had a wonderful time. And I think from that point on, we realized the great value of the Everglades. And it's just like, you know, everybody seems to say, well, it's just a swamp. But uh, <laughs> when you realize that it's what keeps the water clean and uh, a number of other things that uh, it's, it's got a great value. And so we're just interested in hearing the presentation today. Good. Now, Jim Barker. Yes, um, thanks for having me. Yeah, my interest in the Everglades has been, I've been to the Everglades on airboats and I, every time we come up, I have a, a Grand Banks, every time we come up from uh, uh, the Keys, uh, we stop in the Shark River and uh, get in our dinghy and sort of uh, move around a little bit. And, uh, I share the value of of, of the Everglades. Uh, I I know there's some reclamation going on in in terms of the uh, core of engineers who um, facilitated a lot of the uh, destruction of the glades, and I, I'm interested in 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 what type of reversal programs uh, are going on. But I share all of your views that the glades are a very important part uh, of Florida and, uh, and must be protected. Thank you. Bill, Bill Ames, unmute. Usually it's at the top yes. of the screen. Yeah. Yes, hello. Hi. Did somebody ask me a question? Well, we just wanted you to briefly introduce yourself and. Oh. Thank you. Um, yeah, I first came to Boca Grande, I think in 1949. And my grandparents had a house on 13th Street. 
Um, and I, we took the train down, my mother and I, and my godmother from Boston all the way to the terminal of Boca Grande. It's quite something I can hardly, I remember quite a bit, uh, quite a bit of it since it was a good impression. So I visited down there, you know, on and off through my teenage years. And uh, I think my father took over that house and so on and so forth. And I go down there every year between Christmas and New Year's for a week with uh, my significant other, Kathy Stone. So I've been there, I'd say two out of three years over the, um, over the, over time. So um, you stay at the end now and just love the place. So um, I've been a member of the historical side for probably 10 years, something like that. Oh, great. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right, Marty, are you on? Hello. Just unmute, Marty, so we can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Pat. Mm -hmm. uh, glad to see all the folks that have joined this and uh, certainly always want to hear more about the Everglades driving back and forth to the east coast of Florida, going many times through Alligator Alley and knowing there's so much more there. Spending time at the Archbald and learning a lot of what has been impacting the Everglades, certainly north of Okeechobee and through Okeechobee, the impact of sugar and other industries. And it certainly seems a story where we've got to get people to pull together and come up with a plan here that's been addressed for many years. But as you mentioned in some of your comments before, uh, it's almost been on hold for 30 or 40 years as some of these great plans that were supposed to be implemented were not. And uh, I enjoy the history of Marjorie as well, because uh, she certainly was in the forefront and a great leader and appreciating the comments of the folks so far that have made some observations. So thank you again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Nancy, I don't know the last name here, but Nancy, you're next. Hi, how you doing? Hi, good. Hi. Hi. Um, well, we read the first book. We haven't read the second, the Marjorie Stone book, and we love the first book. Um, and we were just, um, we don't know a whole lot about the Everglades, but we're very interested in conservation and environmental issues. We were farmers um, in Virginia for 35 years and just really interested in the environment. So um, that's it. It's good. It's very good. I think that's what brings most of us here today to talk about this. Kaylee, Kaylee Stokes. Hey, um, I'm Kaylee Stokes. Uh, so I'll, I'm here just really to listen and learn. I'm interested. I haven't unfortunately read either of the books. I'll be talking a bit about a uh, presentation I'll be giving in the future. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what y'all have to say? Walter? Or Jack? <laughs> Jack? Walter? Yeah, it's Jack Johnson. Oh, hi, Jack. You can <laughs> unmute. We're ready to hear your lovely voice. <laughs> oh, he's got to unmute or uh, shot him bricks. Can that? you unmute okay. him? Help. Uh, <laughs> there he is. Am I, am I unmuted? Yes. 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 I read The Swamp uh, by Gr Grunwald, and mm -hmm. that kind of interested me. And, yeah. And so I've, I've yet to read. Uh, uh, Marjorie's book, but I've, I've got it on my to-do list. So I, I joined this group just to kind of hear what everybody has to say about it. So um, oh, good. I'm I'm eager to hear this uh, this conversation. Well, I am too. And now, Chuck. Did I lose everybody? No, we're still with you. Thank you. Okay. Chuck, are you ready? What? I'm ready. I'm, uh, I've been watching you review these books with such a passion that I couldn't wait to tune in <laughs> and to find out what is so exciting about the state of Florida and your passion for reading these books. And of course, uh, we've been to the Everglades several times and I'm interested in the preservation and, uh, 
just uh, for a learning experience. And also, like others, I'd like to hear what uh, our community has to say about uh, the Everglades and the state of Florida. Thank you. Robert? Yes. Uh, Robert Levine here. And I just think this is just a great indication how important it is to to read history and study history, that it's so it's so relevant. It's even no no matter how many years old it is, it's still relevant today. Whether it's talking about the Everglades and pollution and red tide and and climate change, or and it's nice to have Kaylee Stokes here, who's going to talk one day about African American history. Yeah. That these are that these issues live live in the present, whether it's it's African Americans or or the the politics behind the the tainting of the water and the Everglades and the issues still still happening today and we need to try to find some kind of some kind of solution and plan and that's what studying history is so so relevant and I want to thank you for these choices of these books. Thanks, Robert. Okay, Ray and Terry. One of you. Hi, hi. This is this is Terry. Um, we have been coming to uh, Florida um, for in the winter time for a while, and um, I uh, was looking for something to do. Now that we are doing virtual presentations. I enjoy reading books and have always been interested in the Everglades. And thank you for doing this program and well, have a good day. Thank you. Gloria. Unmute. <laughs> Hello? Yes, we hear you now. Okay. It takes a while. It does. Um, I just love the uh, historical society. We have been members up north and down here. And I like all the programs you do. I'm just uh, very interested in uh, the Everglades. We take our grandchildren there every year when we come down. So would love to see it restored somewhat. Um, I don't know how much they can do, but it's interesting. It is. Thank they you. Have a plan. They have a plan. Thank you, Gloria. Gay? Gay Darcy, are you ready? Unmute. Yay. Welcome back. Thank you. I had a little difficulty getting in to start with. Hang on. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> that is no doubt a junk call. <laughs> Nobody calls me on my home phone. Um, oh, my car oh. I, I have to admit, I have not finished this book. I read about the first 200 pages and the last 200 pages. And I happen to have up here fourth, the 70th special edition with an afterword added beyond the 11th hour. My, yes. my other copies in Florida. Um, I, I, I came away from what I have read is I must be totally uneducated because to, to read this book, you need to be a, a, a geologist, a seafarer, a, um, a navigator, a fisherman, a pirate, an Indian, a warrior, an archaeologist. There's so much I didn't know. And I just found it totally fascinating that she was able to pull together so many aspects of life that people had to struggle through to survive uh, in, into a book that, that you can read, although it is somewhat encyclopedic. But, um, I mean, it, it could be a reference book for years. It could. Uh, and and it's, more than a t it's more than a history of the Everglades. It's a history of Florida, yeah. South America, <laughs> Central America. It's much more than that. But I think it, it points out how essential preservation of the Everglades is to preservation of our, our world ecosystem, just like the, the jungles in South America. I mean, if we lose the Everglades, that is a devastating impact on our worldwide um, ecosystem. Yes. But the people who need to be 
learning these things aren't us all gray-haired people. It's the kids in school, the kids in high school, the kids in university. They need to learn these things. And frankly, I don't think it's being taught. And Mm -hmm. that's the problem. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Hopefully in Florida it is, but I, I can't verify that for sure. Too many years for me since I've been at a university or high school, but I agree with you, Gay. But it's not too late for each one of us to learn more. And we'll talk about this later in our open discussion, what each of us can do on a regular basis to feel that we have some impact on making it a better world. So thank you. Tricia, would you like to share an idea or two with us and introduce yourself? Yep, I'm here with my mom. We, um, uh, we're new to the Historical Society, um, but we were residents or in Boca Grande. Um, and we thought we'd be interested in just finding out how this all works. So I uh, was excited to be part of this this book and listening to you to the talk. Oh, um, great. Do you want to offer anything? You've been- well, I've, I've been reading the book. I'm up to uh, almost page 400, and it is very interesting. And I read... Uh, I I love the uh, the the first book or the uh, what is it uh, oh, the land remembered oh land remembered yes. yeah, I read that twice we had it at book club and I thoroughly enjoyed that and it's very interesting the different people that tried to settle Florida and how far they got and the conflict with the Indians and the Spaniards and yeah. it's it's a very interesting. I think so too. I'm enjoying it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ken Richardson. Ken, can you unmute and join us? There we go, I think. Yeah, we can hear. Uh, Yes, I I, uh, realized this was going on real late today, so I signed up and was able to join you. I missed uh, the very first part of the presentation, but I had already begun um, the... uh, uh, the book, uh, the the one book, uh, Sea of Grass, River of Grass, and uh, it's fantastic. It is like an encyclopedia. It uh, it reminds me of a lot of James Michener's books, the way he wrote. Uh, and it's amazing to me that what she said those many years ago are so relevant today. So I've uh, enjoyed it. I'm concerned about the Everglades. I don't quite know why we can't turn things around and make things flow the way they're supposed to flow. But uh, it seems like every time there's something that's supposed to happen to help it, it gets put on hold or something, or we have a a heavy heavy rainstorm and it floods the other way. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. I'm a concerned uh, resident now, uh, having moved here from Colorado. And so uh, just interested in in what's going on in this neck of the woods. Very good. Thank you for joining us. Now, there's a lady at the top here. I don't have a name. It says iPad. So introduce yourself. Do you know I'm talking? I don't know how to identify you. You have on a turtleneck and a white sweater, something like that. She's unmuted. It's good. Good. Or trying to. (laughs) Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. My name is Geraldine Bensard. I'm a new resident at Boca Grande, and I was delighted to hear about the Historical Society, and even more delighted when I knew there was a book club. I'm an avid reader, and this book I found was fascinating, enchanting. I loved it, couldn't put it down, and I've looked forward to this discussion ever since the first email came out. I read it immediately, and just found that how could all these things have happened and people aren't thinking of the environment. So I was looking forward to the discussion. So thank you for including me. Oh, very good. Thank you. Uh, Terry Schnook. Hi, yes, I'm Terry Schnook. I um, just, you know, wanted to learn a little bit more about the Everglades. I don't know that much. Um, very interested in history in all all parts of the the country, 
And uh, since we're spending a little more time down here in, uh, in Boca Grande, uh, I'd like to learn a little bit more about the, about Florida. Haven't read the book, but uh, sounds like I ought to pick it up, although it's a, that's a lot of pages to keep my attention. Oh, you've got that right for sure, Terry. Thank you. Audrey? Audrey, we'd love to hear from you. Just unmute. Usually it's at the top of your screen or the bottom left. Nope, I've lost her, I think, for a moment. Okay. All right, now, um, let's see. Okay, Bill, I don't have a last name here. Bill, can you hear me? Should we go up together? Yes. Okay. I can hear you now, sorry. All right, good. Okay, if you just briefly introduce yourself and let us get some idea of your expectations today. Me? Yeah, Bill. Oh no, there's another Bill in the- Yeah, uh, yeah. no, I've, I've already held. For I know Bill, <laughs> Bill Ames, yes, we have heard from you. Yeah. All right, I don't know Bill, I don't see his picture either, so I'm somewhat at a loss. Who have I missed? Yeah, maybe if anybody uh, who hasn't spoken would like to, that'd be great. And if you'd like to be silent, that's fine, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, Angela Fink. Hi. Hi. Can you see me? Uh, no, but I no. can hear you. Okay. Hi, Pam. <laughs> <laughs> I know Pam very well. <laughs> um, I'm up in the panhandle. I'm not in Boca Grande, unfortunately, um, but I am also a master naturalist. I went through the program uh, through the University of Florida and um, love, love any, anything about the environment. Mm -hmm. um, we did visit the Everglades and that was like the best vacation ever. So I just love the area. And I am reading right now a land remembered. I have not read um, River of Grass, but I, I will definitely put it on my list to do. Um, and I really enjoy that land remembered. In fact, I even ordered the student edition for my grandchildren because I think it's really excellent. So Great. my expectation is just to hear what other people have to say. And it's a place that we all love and hope that will continue forever. That's it. All right. Thanks, Angela. You're welcome. Now, did most of you, I think we'll conclude our open discussion right now, or move into our open discussion now. Uh, have most of you heard of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas before the book? Yes. I, yes, most have. Although she's been gone for a little while, she certainly had a tremendous impact uh, nationally as well as in our state. So we hope we can continue to live by those beliefs and do positive things. You know, there is a, a lot that is happening in the Everglades. If you keep track of it on a weekly basis, I try to. Um, and we've just received 250 mil in that stimulus plan uh, to be used immediately, which is 50 mil more than last year. So I think we're moving in the right direction. They have begun to build the reservoir. Uh, they're working on uh, the Kissimmee River, trying to put some curves back into it because it had been straightened out in the belief that that was an important part of moving the water through. And unfortunately, as we all know, that didn't work so well. So anyway, I, I was just curious if most of you were familiar with Marjorie. Oh, yes. Sounds like yes. you are. Most definitely. Um, what, what are your own ideas? for keeping our water clean? 
Well, I think what you can start with doing is is uh, try to petition the legislature. Big sugar and big citrus. Uh, you you probably yeah. all remember the the spill that happened. Or the spill that was a it was a planned event where they dumped all that green goo out of Lake Okeechobee. It came down the Caloosahatchee. It killed everything t- up to twenty miles offshore, ruined the tarpon fishing and all the other fishing. So, you know, big sugar and big citrus are a big part of the problem, man. You got to throw in um, uh, septic tanks and golf courses. Yes, and- fertilizer. Oh yeah, my gosh, and and. You know, and you were talking about what they're going to do. I think what they're uh, they're planning to do is to some of that money is going to go to tear down uh, one of the dams that's over near Deerfield Beach. If you come out of Deerfield Beach, is that massive dam that stops the water from flowing so that the sugarcane people can have the water. And I think they're going to tear that down, which will allow the yeah. water to flow back. And you know, as a result of them stopping or at least sending fertilizer through the Everglades all these years, it created this giant black hole down in Florida Bay. And there's a area 50 miles across that nothing lives. And that's part of the fertilizer problem. Yeah. Anyway, that's, and I want to say one more thing. You know, I was working at the Miami Herald as a, a in the Palm Beach Bureau many years ago. Well, it was 1980. And there was a guy in the office. I mean, this is the Bureau, right? And there's a guy in the office every day. He went to the Southwest Florida Water Management District every day. He did 165 stories on, on <laughs> how, that, what, how good they were doing, but how much worse they were doing in trying to control the waters and the, and the pollution and provide water for all these people. So, you know, he's out, we're out in the Bureau. He won the Pulitzer Prize for that story, just for writing about water. It was a big deal. Well, sure it is. Yeah. I think it's keeping the issue out there, keeping it alive and getting people involved. That was, that was Miss Douglas's goal. You know, she didn't want a lot of bleeding hearts, you know, running around with uh, signs and and protesting, she wanted people to really believe that they had the power to do something. And uh, I know I write my representatives and I stay involved with the Conservancy and Audubon and I get weekly updates. It's just so critical that we stay aware of this because it is the Everglades not only affect Florida, but as Gay and someone else was saying, it affects the United States. You know, well, probably beyond there, but let's just say the U.S. And it's just so critical. We are making small, very small steps, but I, I do think we're moving forward. God, I hope we are. Anyone else have something to say about what you can do just personally, individually? Larry, what about you? There we go. You can hear me now? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, I didn't know what to say because I went first, but my background goes way back. My folks were in the Naples area and all that for years in Appalachia and Everglades City and Alligator Alley, the area that was built and the disaster that was. Tammy Amy Trail, I've been through that stuff a lot. And I kind of, we moved out of there because it really became sad. It It was like Boca 40 years ago and now it's just a big madhouse. And I kind of had that picture until I discovered this area. But in related to the book, I don't, I was, I've been here right in this area quite, a, well, at least almost six months a year or a little more around that for 15 years. And to see what has happened around here is amazing. The fact that they're still saving land and doing things. Uh, the amount of land, the amount of preserves, the area that has just been created as a, it was just the opposite of Naples. Naples was eaten up and swallowed up and developed. And uh, down here, I can list, you know, if you just leave and go up Gasparilla Road or Placida Road, there's all kinds of new preserves. But related to this, Pat and I were talking, I said, my gosh, there's three little... yeah. Everglades projects right near my house. I live on Coral Creek. 
I um, you know, just and uh, that's a beautiful creek, by the way. That's the creek that goes through Placida that you cross when you go to Gasparilla Road. But uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of the Wildflower Project. Yes. I, I helped with that and did the first signs and benches and some of that. And that was fun to be involved in. But that's astounding. I'm sorry to use all these superlatives, but oh. I remember when it was a ratty <laughs> little it. golf course and people were limping around. And now they have redug it up. They've reestablished the water table. They've yeah. Uh, they're putting the mangroves back, and they have retrofit or re-engineered the whole darn thing. And then you look at the Mercado project. Oh. Holy macro. What an inspiring thing. Beautiful. 20 million bucks raised in, what was it, a month, six weeks? Yeah. And watching Four weeks. After like a, I mean, yeah. that's, that's great stuff. One that people don't know about is if you follow Coral Creek, it comes up to a Y and there's an East Branch and a West Branch. And the uh, East Branch has got the bike trail over it and that stuff. But the whole south part of, okay, when I came here, I had a AAA map and it was had all these streets and it had all these canals and it had them written like they were there on the south of Rotunda. Massive mm-hmm. area that's all been bought. And folks, it's been all retrofit and re-engineered. They've been millions of square acres. Uh, well, not many, I'm sorry, but thousands of acres they bought and all of the, these horrific ponds and sluggish uh, algae pits. And you can, you know what it looks like when they just try to dig something up and leave it all there. Well, what they've done is they've taken it all and now it's mangroves. It's going to be a totally... Nice draining, and I live across from, so I canoe up into it. So, Larry, <clears throat> Larry, is this the Gulf Coast yeah, but Conservation have, Foundation that did Coral Creek or another Gulf Coast Conservation? <laughs> that was the state that did it, and they did it very yeah. quietly. Uh, you could hear the machines over there, and we wonder what was going on, so we went back in there. But there are literally going to be a, a whole new massive area of uh, – Carpent nurseries, uh, mangroves, and they've refitted and they've redone. And the fact that that would happen after my not so pretty picture of what happened out in the Naples area and in the Everglades in that area, I, I, it's it's truly amazing to me what's going on. So there is hope. Yeah, Stoneman's book was the foundation of it all. You know that was I took those things and think grad courses in nature and all that stuff. And they were talking about that back then. And it's, I think it does fit. And there is hope. But we got talked talk big sugar and some of those things as a whole other political battle that hasn't well, been completed. It is, but also I think the government has purchased some land back from the big sugar owners and is planning on, you know, making that part of the restoration plan. Yeah. I know that started a few years back. Uh, it's a lot of money, but they're buying the land back as much as they can at a time yeah. and using that for restoration. Anybody else on news of the restoration initiative? Do you all stay up with it on a regular basis? No, you can. Um, tell, us, tell us how we can stay up with it. You can buy, um, well, first of all, uh, Orvis. I think we sent out a film from Orvis. Uh, They have, let's see, a website. We'll post it later. But they have a website that keeps you up to date on everything that's happening. happening. It's Orvis slash Everglades, I believe. Uh, And... I just happen to belong to Audubon and Nature Conservancy, so I get a weekly update from both of those organizations. But you can pretty much find out information online just by putting in an an Everglades Initiative plan. Even the Seminole and the Miccosukees, believe it was in 2014, set aside $85 million to begin their own initiative in Big Cypress. And yeah. they're doing a lot to clean the water in their area and the reservation. And uh, 
other restorative work under the auspices of the federal government, but they all they are working too. And you know, I wanted to talk more about the Indians, but there's so much in this book that when I first when I completed the book, I started writing and I got carried away between the environmental issues and the Miccosukee Seminoles, which are dear to my heart, somewhat like David's story. Mm-hmm. And meeting Chief Jim Billy, you know, was quite an experience in itself and attending a gathering of the nation. 10,000 islands. Anyway, the Seminoles knew that something was wrong long before we did because they live in the land, not on top of it, but in it. And they knew it was dying. And their belief is that if they don't do something positive to change this, that they will die too because they believe that they are the land. It's one, just one unified entity. So they're doing a lot themselves. All right. Well, <clears throat> anybody else have any ideas on this particular staying, staying tuned in? You know, it doesn't hurt to write to your representatives either, which I do frequently through the Audubon page. They keep us up to date. So it doesn't hurt to do that and let them know that we care and we're watching. So, you know, there's a, a couple of interesting resources. If you're just kind of tapping into this subject, there's a fellow by the name of Max Stone, who's a fabulous photographer and also a real naturalist. And he's put together a couple of presentations. He's made them in Boca Grande, but they're now available online. And he's put together a TED presentation. It's about 45 minutes. It's mm-hmm. the most spectacular footage you'll ever see of any anything nature. And it's about the Everglades and the challenges, and he gets deep into it. And he's really, it's a spectacular presentation. If you want to get more hands-on, I don't know, many of you know about the Archibald Biological Station, which is an hour and a half from Boca Grande in Venus, Florida, along the spine that goes through the middle of Florida with an elevation of about 500 feet. And it's one of the 26 biological stations in the country run by a fabulous lady named Hillary Swain, who will take your breath away and just be so informative. And you see both sides of the fence there. You see what they're trying to do, as well as they've just been donated an 8,000 acre cattle ranch, where as part of the experience there, you get into these buggies that looks like it's something out of Africa, and you go back into the wilds to see what's going on there and see what's happening with the Lake Okeechobee and the tributaries and the Kissimmee and straightening out the Kissimmee, the overflows that are being caused in the Caloosahatchee. But it's a week, if you spend, I say a week, if you spend an afternoon there and get a room in town or stay there, I think there's facilities there. And the next day you go on the ranch tour, it's really, it's really kind of cool. And uh, both of those, uh, people to be exposed to are something that will really kind of grab you and get you deeper into these books and what's been going on and where the monies are going and where the water's going. And right now the Caloosahatchee is getting drained through Okeechobee into where we are right now. And there's been yeah. some discussion between, you know, go back and forth on all this between the links of those rivers going in with the red tide that is being nurtured by the nutrients, but mm-hmm. it's a, uh, it's fascinating, but it get, it does get uh, a bit frustrating when you get deep into this stuff, as many of you just kind of made those observations. But that's uh, that's my comment. Don't mean to monopolize. Well, no. Marty, I didn't think anybody knew where Venus, Florida was. <laughs> yeah, We've all been there, not all. It's pretty cool there. there. It's, it uh, is so small. It's about the size of a dime. But <laughs> it, was that the Likes Farm or the Likes Ranch that you're talking about? No, no, it's the uh, MacArthur uh, Ranch next to uh, Archbold's uh, uh, main facility, and they they now own the entire MacArthur uh, Ranch land as well, and uh, do a lot of cattle raising uh, research. It's an amazing place, and the friends when um, 
when COVID's over and trips can resume, uh, the friends I know will offer the eco trip to Archwell. They also offer the wonderful trip to the Everglades that many of us taken, but people will be able to get to Archbold again with the friends and you really should go. It is an amazing place. Mm. And some of us uh, are working on uh, creating a, an internship fund in Boca Grant's name uh, there. They do just marvelous scientific research. Somebody mentioned earlier the need to get the younger generation involved. Mm-hmm. And uh, hopefully soon we're going to we're going to uh, be able to put together the funds so we we have a Boca Grand uh, internship at uh, Archbold. Oh, that's very good news. iPad. <laughs> what do you think about the history? Yeah, you got a question? Oh, okay. Hi. Can you hear? I'm right on. Yeah. Great. This is a very simplistic question from me reading the book because I'm new here. What is the difference between the Everglades and the Big Cypress Swamp? I pulled up maps looking at them. They sit right next to each other. What is the difference between them? And are, and are both of them in development or can you explain the difference? Oh, well, Big Cypress, part of that is the uh, Seminole Reservation. And it is, all of that is part of the Everglades. Am I correct on that? David, Larry, Larry. Angela. Like Fakahatchee Strand, same mm-hmm. thing. It's all part yeah. of the same ecosystem. It's all part of the Everglades. They're yeah, there's what, million two acres all together with, with both. They do run... Uh, together and it really is all part of the same ecosystem. It's like they they talk about the 10,000 islands. That's Mm -hmm. part of the Everglades. Yeah. And the Everglades used to be 10 or 12 million acres. Am I right on that? So what's been preserved is like 10% of of what was... The Everglades went up past almost Okeechobee, Mm -hmm. almost to Orlando on some old map. That's where the Kissimmee River is, yeah. Yeah. Is yeah, that how you screw up too when they straightened out the Kissimmee River back in the yeah. 60s? It was a nightmare, 50s and 60s. You put all those dikes up and, and uh, yeah. straighten the river out, created a false. They did it for cattle so they could raise cattle yeah. on that land. Exactly. Yeah, and Disney. Disney didn't yeah, want Disney, any flooding. Well, Disney came later, but certainly that yeah. was. Uh, result (laughs) and so that's also part of the archbold trip we've been getting on the Kissimmee and seeing the uh the uh the oxbows return to the river and it's it's all part of an amazing couple days i noticed that there's somebody named victoria babcock online she's down here at the bottom i wonder if she's part of the babcock folks out of Punta Gorda. They own a massive piece of swamp land over there that they dedicate, they gave to the state of Florida. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Victoria, are you with us? I didn't get a response before. I see the name, but I don't know if she's really with us right now. Um, On reading the book, you know, What did you think about the promises made by the government and the promises broken? Not only to, of course, the Indians, of course, the freed blacks, but also to the early settlers, the ranchers, and the people who came here thinking that they were going to raise cattle, thinking that they were this was agricultural land and that there wouldn't be any flooding and that everything would be controlled and managed. Promises made and promises broken. That runs throughout the entire book, really. Mm -hmm. Um, Any comments from folks on that? I mean, I think that still occurs today. Gay, do you have any thoughts on that? 
Unfortunately, promises made and promises broken seems to be the uh, mainstay of politics. Um, Unfortunately. I, I don't find, I mean, I hate to sound so cynical, but just in the, the recent, I don't know, last 30 years, there have been promises offered, if you will, by, by presidents, by uh, governors, by legislators, and then someone else came along with a better deal for him, and that promise vanished. It's it's very sad. Um, it is. It, I don't know how we as a society can be more vocal, or 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 I certainly won't say militant, but more vocal and and more uh, effective in getting our leadership to listen to what needs to happen and to somehow outmaneuver the industries that have the big dollars that they can weigh before the faces of these politicians. And I don't know how that can happen. Campaign finance reform. <laughs> okay, there's one. Good well, luck. And that, of course, is asking the fox to, uh, to no. safeguard the hen house. <laughs> Yeah, I keep hoping all of us new Floridians, because we really see this, and it's amazing to us um, that there hasn't been more preservation. And Larry's talking about Naples, and we've all seen what's happened to the downtown waterfront in Sarasota in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just uh, tragic and mind-boggling, uh, but development fees and other money clearly talks, uh, but maybe with all of us coming in who are newer, we may raise a voice because I think we all see the um, nature of this. Well, there was no stopping Florida development. I mean, as <laughs> sports writer said, the answer to all your questions is money. <laughs> And so it was pure greed, you know, and all, and even Floridians sold their souls and sold their land to, yeah. to profit. So, you know, big bucks, what are you going to do? It's, it's difficult to fight it. Well, if you want to see an interesting exhibit, the uh, History Center is uh, have, having a presentation or a walk by right next to between Hudson's and um, Gasparilla Outfitters, and we have got five tables of then and now pictures, pictures of Boca Grande in the 30s and what it looks like right now, as spectacular as it is, but it's uh, it's really a cool exhibit that Nancy Lyons and some of the people at the History Center put together. It, it's at 1030 this Monday, and it's just a walk by. Uh, it'll it's going to uh, run all day, well I guess. Managed yeah. through through the afternoon and it's free of charge, but some of these pictures are spectacular and uh, they'll certainly be up places where your homes are right now. And just looking at the before and after uh, and it's amazing. Uh, certainly as much as the Island's been developed, it seems we were fortunate that it was done in most cases the right way. So uh, it's encouraging and I think you'll get a kick out of it. And that's, that's this Monday. One question I had Pat was, did, and I guess I should know this, did Marjorie do all this research work on her own? Because as you read the book, you just wonder how, how she organized it and kept it together unless she had 10 or 15 or 20 people doing her research and she was putting it together. But did, was this all her? I think a lot of it was her. I, I mean, she thanks people uh, somewhere in the book for the help and the information that they gave her, but she traveled through most all of those places in Florida and made her first trip to the Everglades, I think, shortly after she joined her father at the Herald. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying she did all of it completely, but I think she did a lot of it. Well, remember, she lived to be 108. Mm -hmm. I met her when she was probably in her late 70s and she was <laughs> She was like a kid, you know, and just filled with enthusiasm and so much knowledge that, you know, now we're talking 
back in the 80s, we were, you know, I think we all knew the Everglades were in trouble, but not to the extent that she described it. But when the people left that room, everyone had a conviction in their heart that they were going to continue to carry on and try to do something to the best of their ability, whatever it might be. Sometimes, you know, it's it's such a big topic. I didn't want to be negative in this presentation, and it's easy to be because our progress has been so very, very small, and there's been a lot of money dedicated to the uh, initiative. And uh, But I think that we have to just continue to push forward and keep in touch with our representatives. I think our governor has an awareness you know, I don't want to get political with this, but I think he does have an awareness and has yep, been yeah. you know, knocking really on good. the door for money. So it's to be used, that stimulus package, that money has to be used immediately. So hopefully it'll be used in the right way. Supposedly it's going toward the reservoir. Which is needed. Mm -hmm. So we have to continue to believe that, of course. But this whole book, here's what fascinated me. It's the mystery of impenetrable places on earth, man's desire to discover and to conquer. Has it changed in our lifetime? Focus has shifted to outer space, I would assume. Um, and underwater, of course. Underwater, certainly. Yeah. What they're finding under there now in some places is not very attractive. But, but that may lead to, lead to cleaning up the oceans, too. So that has a positive benefit. But that's the nature of mankind. Uh, yeah. Are you asking us if this is what men, man does? <laughs> Yeah, is it, is it part it. of, yeah, is it part of the DNA to go for the, because as I was reading Marjorie's book, it's like all these different groups of people over, you know, this hundred years time span all wanted to conquer the Everglades. And uh, there aren't that many mysterious places left on earth because man well, when I say man, you know, I'm talking humankind. humankind. Man has pretty much conquered most of it. Not always to the best, as we see. But I think that's that's part of the DNA. Anyway, it's just a thought well, I have. Pat, it's certainly what Patrick Smith, you know, I think uh, did describe in a land remembered the contrast uh, with Tobias and Zach, and then uh, Saul. I mean, as we know, I'm, for better or worse, and it seemed to be in Saul's DNA, he was all about development and conquering and, and kept seeing, uh, he thought he was being positive, of course. He's seeing, in his head, he's seeing opportunity, which unfortunately for him meant economic opportunity as opposed to preservation. Um, opportunity. So it, uh, you know, it's a strong theme in, in Patrick's book, written 40 years after, after Marjorie, saying many of the same things, but in a, in a very different way. It's fascinating to put the two together. I think so, too. Well, we look forward and to at the work. end. He saw the error of his ways. Oh, mm -hmm. oh Solomon uh, and yeah. Land yeah. remembered. And remembered. Yeah. Yeah. Why is it always too late? Yeah. And it was. Slow learners. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and Marjorie said that man's the most destructive creature on the earth. When she was describing the animals in the Everglades, and she said when man came, he was the most destructive of all. So, Still are. wish people could learn from that. Yeah. And, and so I think, you know, literature reading um, really is, a, as we all know, that's, I guess, why we're here in some ways, that to focus on these deeper 
ideas to be guided in in how to look at things and and maybe as as we look at history uh using that to find our path forward in a better way agreed for sure i think the book can be utilized as sort of a springboard to point out what the benefits are and the beauty of preservation of the Everglades could mean, not just to Floridians, but to others as well. And, you know, I guess we need to stop beating up those who've gone before and not done so well by the Everglades and instead focus on the positive. Mm. But, but I think if, 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 as a nation, we want to preserve the Everglades. We need to involve people and the uh, people from other parts of the United States yes. need to care about it as well. Yeah, yeah you know that's that's a great idea, uh, Gay. I, I and I I applaud that idea. Uh, I think part of the big issue is that how do you get people into the Everglades? It's not like you're going to walk in through the redwood forest yeah. and try to say, oh, we need to save this. If you, if you could get people into it, like on those airboat rides, if there's any way you could create some sort of a program where you could, you know, the Miccosukee and the Seminoles could make money off of this deal and take people back in there. And once you got a mile away from that highway, you realize how important this place is. Yeah, you really do. But so Kaylee... Kaylee, do you have a historical perspective? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but your background is history. Uh, yeah, this isn't really an area of expertise for me, so so I don't. Um, but I mean, personally, I grew up, spent part of my um, growing up years in South Florida. Um, so my parents live in sort of the, the West Palm Beach area. And whenever I drive down to see them, I mean, it's just fields and fields of sugar cane when you get to that last bit. Um, and so, yeah, it is definitely interesting, but something that is so important and has such a large effect on, on us as a state isn't, um, just paid more attention to, I guess. So, yeah, we may need you doing some more oral histories with those who are there and can talk about this as we'll all hear a little more about next month. Yeah, it'd be great, like, um, in the reservations that y'all are talking about to do some oral histories in there. Um, yeah. That would be really, really cool. That would be fun. Well, I but think... It, you know, it is amazing when you fly down and you're flying along either coast and there's this density. And then you look 10 miles to the east or the west and it's just wide open. I mean, just so much more space down here. It's just, it boggles your mind. You get trapped up in this five or 10 as you were talking about earlier, five or 10 miles on each coast. And you start going in and taking these side roads that God only knows where they're going. But it's amazing there's that much property left down here. It's so wide open. I hope we can preserve what we, we can afford to preserve as quickly as we can. It's really important. And that's the thing that really Florida is all about. I mean, that... Three quarters of the state really wasn't habitable. Uh, people have now, you know, developers have come in and built on top of the on top of the Everglades. That Golden Gate area, you know, that you see on the news all the time. They have bobcats walking through their backyard and black bear, and people are always so surprised. You know, well, we're raising our family here, and there's our swing set and our barbecue grill, but that's right in the heart of the Everglades. You know, how, how were they ever allowed to build in there? I have no idea. I don't know. I was at the Corkscrew Swamp one day with actually with our garden club here. And we had a question and answer period with a, <clears throat> a naturalist in the um, learning center. And several of the people in the audience were from the Golden Gate area. And they were just trying to figure out how they could keep the wildlife out of their backyards because they don't have a fence. And, you know, they were, the uh, instructor was giving all kinds of tips. Well, use bells, ring bells to scare away the bobcats. 
but for goodness sake, well, you know, you can't, obviously you can't kill anything. Um, but people are living right in the heart of the Everglades in, you know, standard housing, raising their families, going to school, roads going here, there, and everywhere. It just, it's fascinating because when you leave that area, it's just all Everglades. It's amazing. But anyway, they were, that's the development, you know, so there it goes. I think we need to conclude our book discussion today and try to be as positive we can and do positive things to continue to work toward the renourishment initiative. It's very important. And we will post some uh, sites uh, for the person who asks uh, on perhaps our website or constant contact or some way we'll communicate with you, come up with some sites that you can visit and stay up on what's happening with the initiative. Gay, okay. Does anybody know if there's a good drone production, a flyover of the Everglades? Oh, that's a I'm sure there is. Oh. I mean, because you can get so close to it with the drones closer than with airplanes. And wow, that's a good idea. I was wondering yeah. if anybody knows of a production like that that we could help uh, help disseminate. You know, what would be interesting, too, is if they could do a, a flyover of the entire Everglades from the East Coast to the West Coast and then speed it up really fast. It would still take like five minutes to go through it. <laughs> Even if it was sped up, you know what I mean. It would be a, it would be really fast, but you'd see the immenseness of it even at fast speed. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we'll ask our production company because I think they have done some work in the Everglades and definitely in that part of the state. So we'll check on that and let you know. Stay tuned. I just kind of, I just kind of googled the subject. There's all kinds of things. Drone flies over Everglades wilderness. Fort. <laughs> I know. It's a lot. Get, get a glass of wine and just do it right now. Okay. <laughs> to prepare for this, I had 25 pages. Hey, how about Crazy. a six pack for Mr. Fush? Can they I'm pick sorry? Up this, get a six pack and take a look at this drone over the other I'm, place. I'm going to. That's the first thing I'm going to do. That Good. sounds great. I think so too. <laughs> All right. Well, let's wrap it up for today. Okay. Look forward to seeing you at our next book discussion. We don't have a date yet, but here we go. Thank you for being an important part of today's discussion. At this time, I want to introduce two of our speakers that most of you have already been introduced to. Uh, David Futch, January 19th at 2 o'clock. David will offer a sneak preview of the book he is writing sharing some never-before-told stories about several residents and visitors from the mm -hmm. island's past. And David, I'll let you speak to that, and then I'm going to introduce Kaylee. Do you have anything you want to add? Uh, yeah. I'm giving away too much. No, no, not at all. Uh, I'm going to read the introduction to my book, which pretty much lays out what the book is about, and it's about everybody who was ever on Boca Grande, from the Calusa Indian, to the to the Crown and Shields, to the Englehards, to to Bard Sharp, to Sam Whitten. Uh, there there are stories. There are, the stories I'm going to read. Well, I'm going to read the introduction, and then I'm going to read um, uh, the first couple of pages of a chapter I wrote about my grandfather, who was a rum smuggler, and uh, it talks about one of his dangerous trips down. And then I'll finish with. Uh, uh, the first two or three pages of a chapter on tarpon fishing. And then we'll take questions. Okay. I'm looking so this forward. Is great. This is Tuesday. This is Tuesday next week coming Tuesday up. It's going to be week. a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. All right. Now, Kaylee, Kaylee Stokes, who you met today, will be speaking on February 9th at 2. And she will talk about the interviews she did of several Black residents of the island and wow. asking them to share their experiences in their own words, which yeah. you have the opportunity to hear. Kaylee, would you like to say a word about your presentation? 
Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm really excited about this presentation um, because this is based on work that I did for my undergraduate thesis. And I interviewed um, members of the Black community that had previously lived on uh, Gasparilla Island. And uh, I think what's going to be really cool is that we're actually going to play excerpt, audio excerpts from the interview. So you're really going to get to hear their voices and connect connect to these folks and hear from some really amazing women like Florence Jokes and her sisters mm. um, and Johnny Johnson, which I don't know if you've ever seen the picture of the little black boy on the giant fish <laughs> for Boca Grant, um, but that's him in, in that photo. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about how that fits into the history of, of Boca Grand and also just the power of um, the power and importance of collecting these personal stories uh, when preserving local history um, and how meaningful that can be. And, and sort of like in this conversation about how can we do something and, and feel that sense of agency. And I think learning history of individuals and not just of, uh, you know, corporations or politicians and government is really important to uh, instilling that sense of agency in each of us. So. I'm excited to to talk with y'all and there'll obviously be time for, for some Q&A. Oh, yeah, and both of these, of course, are going to be by Zoom like this. So you just go back to the website and sign up. We Kaylee, look forward to it, from? Kaylee. I'm sorry. Kaylee, Kaylee where are you from? Um, I live in Sarasota right now. So I went to New College of Florida and I actually currently work there. So Well, how did you, how did you possibly find out about uh, the Black uh, community on Boca Grande? <laughs> Good question. They been there for so long. What what did you say? They have not been there for so long. Yeah, so that was sort of my interest. I had done an oral history tutorial um, as a third year college student um, with a white woman who now lived in Sarasota, who had used to live on Gasparilla Island, um, and so I got really interested in the history there um, and drove down to the island and did some research and talked to the historical society and, and went to the um, museum there, the lighthouse museum. Um, and they had the one panel about the black community that lived there. Um, and so I was figured there was probably more to, to that story than just what fit on one panel. There used to be a place called Tarpon Pass Estates. I'm sure you, they told yeah. you. Yeah. And, and some of the rich folks on the island built that so that, Actually, so they could keep the help around yeah. while they were. Yeah. So yeah, we'll talk all about that. But it was what a heck of a place. It was you used to it was an honor to be invited to go down there and, and dance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's actually a, one of my favorite moments of the the excerpts that I'll play when when I talk. It's February 9th at 2 p.m. Um has to do with um music. And it, it's a really funny moment from, from one of the interviews. So, yeah. We look forward to both David and Kaylee's presentations. We also ask you all to register for our historic tour of homes online or by calling our office. This one of a kind virtual event will allow you to see inside homes that may never have been on view before. Your continued support and loyalty, you know this, are so greatly appreciated. Renew your membership, continue to enjoy our programs via Zoom this season. Our calendar of events is posted on our website. Become a member if not already. So we thank you all for making this possible. Bringing history to life. Thank you. Thank you. And we will do this again. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you all. It was thank fun. You. I enjoyed it. Well Very done. Much.